Hi, Cindy. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> to use the podium or to sit where at, at, at the at the desk whatever is more con comfortable and convenient all right We'll begin. I'm, I'm sure people will continue to wander in. Um, I'm Cindy Arnson. I'm director of the Latin American program here. It is truly a pleasure to be partnering with the IMF um, for this important discussion. And we're also very pleased to have Alejandro Werner, director of their Western Hemisphere Department, and, and his colleagues with us um, this morning. We've all heard, the, especially over the World Bank IMF meetings, the sobering predictions concerning the lower rates of growth in Latin America in, and the Caribbean, not only this year, but also in the foreseeable future. Low or mediocre growth, as well as low commodity prices, may well be the new normal, um, at least in the short and medium term. Following the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, many countries of the region used the bonanzas from high commodity prices to implement countercyclical policies that helped cushion the shock to their own economies. And Latin American countries indeed prided themselves on being the last in and the first out of the global crisis. So now, a new IMF report focuses on case studies of Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay, um, looking at the fiscal policy frameworks that have been adopted since um, the 2009 crisis and the extent to which institutional reforms have been adopted that will serve as an anchor for fiscal policy. Our own project on, on tax reform um, here at the Wilson Center, represented by Jim Mayen, who joins us from Williams College via video, has taken a slightly different approach on this same important topic, exploring how and to what extent fiscal policy reforms have served to lower the region's world-class levels of inequality. And one area in which our work and the work of the IMF um, study has overlapped 
um, concerns the, um, the kinds of reforms that are necessary to increase the transparency and efficiency of government spending. I believe you have the bios of our presenters, and so I'll introduce them only briefly. Um, Alejandro Werner has been the director of Western Hemisphere at the IMF since January of 2013. He is a native of, of Mexico um, and also served as Undersecretary of Finance and Public Credit in his, um, in his home country from December 2006 until August 2010. He's also had um, distinguished career in teaching and in the private sector. Um, presenting the report will be Oya Selasun, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Deputy Division Chief in the, in the Western Hemisphere Department um, and currently Mission Chief uh, for uh, Uruguay. Um, also had, I guess, the distinct um, difficulty of working on the United States desk from 2008 to 2012. Not a happy time uh, in this country. Uh, Maria Luz eh, Morena, eh, More, Moreno eh, Badia is also a Deputy Division Chief um, in the IMF's Fiscal um, Affairs Department. Um, we've been joined in many uh, parts of our, of our project by Vito Tanzi, also someone who, um, who was there, um, and she has published widely on this subject. Um, and then uh, we'll have two commentators, one here in person, Carlos Ve, who is at uh, Johns Hopkins SICE, and um, when he is not there, he's also at the Department of Economics um, in, uh, in Baltimore at the Zanville Krieger School of Arts and Sciences, um, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and also a non-resident fellow um, at the Brookings Institution. And last but certainly not least, um, Jim Mayen is not from this Woodrow Wilson Center, but as the Woodrow Wilson Professor of Political Science at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. He has, uh, he's really one of th this country's foremost experts on questions of fiscal policy in Latin America. Um, he has uh, written extensively in academic journals and books, um, and his current research is focusing on fiscal politics and reform um, of the state. So once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you to the IMF and, and our colleagues for um, presenting the results of their research, for partnering with us. Um, Alejandro, we look forward to your comments. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. And first of, uh, first of all, uh, welcome. Welcome to, it, to this presentation. I want to take the opportunity to thank the Wilson Center for hosting us uh, and to give us a venue to present our latest work on, on Latin America, as Cynthia was, uh, was saying. And we want to thank also Veronica Colon for putting this, uh, this event together. We're very much looking forward also to the commentary by the, uh, by, by the two distinguished uh, commentators uh, that have worked a lot on, on these issues in the region and uh, we expect a lot from, uh, from their insights. And let me just very briefly uh, introduce the topic. I mean, since uh, the world, of, the world financial crisis, Latin American countries have uh, utilized fiscal policy in a very different way than what you what uh, was used in the in the past. I mean, a, a very important experiment on countercyclical fiscal policy was launched in almost uh, every country, uh, with different degrees of intensity and with different uh, effects. So we thought it was time to take stock of what was uh, the lessons from that experience and how looking forward to these countries uh, needed to fine tune or rearrange their, the way they implement fiscal policy, their institutional setup within which they undertake a fiscal policy to continue strengthening, strengthening their fiscal tool both as an important uh, structural tool, but also as a counter-cyclical instrument in their, in their toolkit. I mean, having said that, let me just, uh, as way of introducing the, the study, maybe uh, highlight what are the key questions that the study tries to answer. Uh, and I think uh, the study does a, a great job in laying out uh, the, the agenda, in giving us some important first answers to these questions, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of uh, research still to be done on how, um, I mean, our countries are, 
working in terms of uh, fiscal policy. In terms of impact, I mean, the main question was what was the fiscal policy reaction to the crisis and was that, what was the impact on, 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 on growth? At the end of the day, the main objective of this uh, experiment was to limit or to minimize the negative effect of the external shock into the Latin American economies. In terms of legacies, three questions. Did fiscal policy remain accommodative after the crisis to some extent? Uh, how fast or how should we compare the uh, implementation of the stimulative part of the effort and how well the countries uh, unwind, unwinded this effort to actually go back to a neutral policy once the uh, cycle induced by the shock was, uh, was over? How much have fiscal policy buffers therefore been eroded and what was the impact on the resilience of public finances? And third, how did the crisis impact fiscal policy framework and what shortcomings were revealed in the institutions? I mean, at the end of the day, we had a framework that uh, in many cases was relatively new. Uh, it was never, uh, let's say we went through a natural stress test of our fiscal frameworks and that's exactly where you actually find out how resilient they were both uh, or First, if they were flexible enough to accommodate these type of shocks. Secondly, if they were resilient to the kind of political economy pressures that you face during these uh, turmoils. And third, I mean, to what extent they were resilient to the, uh, to the implementation of policy <coughs> from some of the governments that established these institutional frameworks. I mean, at the, at, at the end of the day, uh, I, I think that that's an important uh, lesson to learn, both to design frameworks that provide the flexibility that is needed under these circumstances, <laughs> to try to establish in, uh, in trying to fine tune these frameworks, uh, frameworks that are, are a little bit more resilient to the political economy pressures that uh, are actually exposed during these big uh, negative shocks. And looking ahead, I mean, I mean, the key short-term question is how much do buffers need to be rebuilt? Second, how much can be achieved by increasing spending efficiency, as Cynthia was uh, mentioning, to the extent that we are uh, moving towards an environment of lower growth, higher interest rates, and lower commodity prices. <laughs> that means that public sector income will not be increasing at the same rates that increased in the past, and therefore, much more would have to be done on the side of expenditures to actually to continue satisfying society's needs in terms of better public services, et cetera, uh, than just throwing more money to these problems because uh, if we want to maintain healthy public finances, uh, income will not be there and a lot would have to come from uh, the expenditure side. Secondly, how much can be achieved by increasing, as I said, uh, spending efficiency? And third, what institutional reforms or changes or fine tuning is needed to continue building uh, these frameworks that actually uh, generate the right mix of rules and discretion to implement fiscal policy effectively. So with that introduction, I mean, I, I turn the, the mic to the authors of, of, of the report and, and, and then to the commentators. Thank you very much. Jim, if you're there, um, could you mute your microphone? We're getting a lot of background noise. Are you hearing me? Did we mute you? <laughs> Hi. Jim. There you go. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah. I, I didn't hear the sorry, last part of Alejandro's remarks. Could you mute your microphone uh, if you have that capability just to mute the uh, don't disappear? And we want you to be able to hear, but we're getting a fair amount of background noise every time you move in your chair. <laughs> okay. Nice potato on the wall, too, by the way. Okay. Okay, thank you, Cynthia and Alejandro, for the introductions. Um, I'll, what I'll do first, <coughs> first off, is to go over the main style I set on fiscal policy over the last decade. Um, it's been, uh, before I start, let me just, again, Cynthia said this, but this, is, this study focuses on six uh, countries in Latin America. I'll often refer to them as the LA6. Uh, this includes Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. These are the countries that are um, 
confronting the end of the double tailwinds that have supported the um, region over the past decade. Uh, they are they are all commodity producers and they are all financially integrated. Um, so uh, that's why we have chosen to focus on that. Okay, so I'll go over three phases before the crisis, during the crisis, and fiscal policy in the aftermath of the crisis. So ahead of the crisis, again, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, the LA six countries enjoyed a period of uh, relatively strong economic growth, supported by favorable terms of trade, a commodity uh, price boom, and uh, easy financial solutions globally. And uh, on the back of this, they have also enjoyed, uh, they also enjoyed a good fiscal performance. So here in this chart, take the example of uh, Chile. This, the red lines here, the colors are not very clear, but the upward swinging curves show the difference, the change in the uh, fiscal balance, the primary fiscal balance, that is excluding interest payments, between 2003 and 2007, the year before the crisis. So we've set the beginning level to zero in all countries for comparability of the change. The, what you see is that there was an improvement in all countries, and in some cases quite dramatic. For example, in Chile, between the, in, during those five years, you saw an eight percentage points of GDP improvement in the primary, primary balance, the annual primary balance. In Peru, it was five. Uh, admittedly, when you strip out the effects of the economic cycle, the effects of commodity prices, the, the strengthening was uh, somewhat less impressive. But all in all, uh, this helped countries improve their balance sheets, the government balance sheets, build buffers, uh, and set the stage for these countries to join the ranks of the countries at that time in 2009, uh, 2008, when the crisis hit the global economy, join the ranks of the countries that introduced significant amounts of fiscal stimulus. The red bars, what were the red bars, sorry, um, show the, fis the amount of fiscal easing. Sorry, okay. The red bars, the taller bars, show the amount of fiscal easing. Uh, this we measure by looking at the changing the cyclically adjusted primary fiscal balance. Uh, there was an easing in five out of the six countries on the, in the range of two percentage points of GDP to three and a half percentage points of GDP. These are quite large numbers. Uh, Uruguay was the only country that didn't show an easing that year. It had already eased fiscal policy considerably the year before. Four out of the six countries had introduced uh, discretionary stimulus programs. Um, what's important to note here is that this easing that happened that year actually typically went well beyond what was announced as stimulus. So there was a generalized easing of policy, typically coming from the spending side, something that we will look at again uh, later. So this was quite a turn of events for a set of countries that were previously famous for exacerbating the cycle. Uh, by running for cyclical fiscal policy whenever negative sh shocks hit. It's a literature that uh, Carlos has contributed large volumes of work uh, that I'm sure we'll hear about more. Okay, so the stimulus was launched. Uh, it was large. The, the big question, of course, after these policy moves is what was the effect on output? How effective was this in containing output losses? And this brings us to the contentious debate on fiscal multipliers. What is the effect of a given easing in fiscal policy on output? It's notoriously difficult to measure. The, the route we have taken is to use a range of multipliers here. Um, multipliers from the empirical literature, which are basically um, averages in, his, in past data, um, I would say of the correlations between fiscal policy easing and the output response. We have also used a calibrated general equilibrium model where the uh, size of the fiscal multipliers depend on the structure of the economy, the state of the economic cycle. Those are the blue bars. The, econo the econometric um, result calculations are shown by the little diamonds. All in all, the bottom line is that these calculations yield a response. It varies by country, but it yields a response of about three uh, quarters of a percentage point to slightly more than two percentage points of GDP. So this suggests that this was this ef effort, this proactive response helped countries um, avoid greater output losses at the time. 
and more generally highlights the value, insurance value of having built up buffers during the good times to be able to deal with the negative shocks um, when they come. Okay, so that's sort of the good part of the story. Um, then what happened after the crisis was more mixed. What we see as a general trend is, is that the expansion of the crisis was not reversed fully. The, the way we show that here in this chart, sorry, uh, is with the red curves, these ones. So the first leg down is, shows the easing, the uh, loosening in the cyclically adjusted uh, primary balance. In all countries, there was an easing. When you look at the, w it's a window of two years here. You see some easing in all countries. And then the leg up, the what happens after the diamond, sorry, um, here is the extent to which this easing was reversed between 2009 and 2013. And you see that the, the uh, withdrawal of the stimulus was incomplete in all cases. The country that came closest to uh, reversing the easing was Chile, even there that it was incomplete. In fact, in Uruguay, you see uh, continued easing in fiscal policy over time. Now, this is a pretty common phenomenon. It's not by any means unique to the LA6 countries. What makes these countries somewhat different, this, uh, what's special about this case is that these countries are actually the ones that performed quite strongly after the global financial crisis. Um, what we see across other emerging market economies, advanced economies, is that these countries never recovered really in terms of the levels of output to the pre-crisis trend. But um, these countries did. So there was a strong rebound on the back of a faster than expected recovery in commodity prices. Here we show that by uh, plotting the output gaps alongside the uh, fiscal balances. Many of these countries, so the output gap, we measure it as, as a dis how far output levels are from what we call potential output, which is the level of output you get when resources are being utilized to a normal extent. Many of these crises, when they entered the, the uh, sorry, many of these countries, when they entered the crises, were, they had economies that were operating above potential. And there was a large um, drop in output relative to potential, but then by the time we were in 2013, all of these countries had at least closed the output gap. Many of them were, had already returned to a strong economic position. So all in all, what this says, um, and this is in a way the main opening to the paper, is that um, the countries had a good economic recovery and they missed the opportunity to withdraw the stimulus in a counter-cyclical manner. So they, in, a, in other words, man didn't manage to withdraw the fiscal stimulus when the economy was um, doing well and growing above its uh, normal <coughs> rate of growth. Okay. And underlying this, there was an interesting um, stylized fact, quite a stri striking stylized fact that is common to all the countries. There was a significant increase in the level of spending around the years of the crisis, bet around 08 and 09. The average increase in the spending to GDP ratio here is four percentage points of GDP. That's large. When you consider that the starting point is somewhere between 20 to 30 percentage points of GDP, a four percentage point addition is quite significant. And uh, what one has to keep in mind <coughs> is that going forward, spending pressures are only uh, bound to increase further in these countries. A common stylized fact is that as countries grow richer, as income levels rise, Citizens uh, expect a greater quality and volume of public services. Uh, and this is something that's actually playing out. We're seeing it happen in Chile with the education, demand for a better education system, for example. Uh, and there's also aging. So this, these pressures are going to come on top of this step up in spending, and it's going to be an important uh, feature of the fiscal landscape that policymakers uh, will have to deal with going forward. I now um, leave the floor to Maria Luz to start looking at the implications of all of this for fiscal space and institutions. Okay, so what we have seen so far is the fiscal reaction, the immediate fiscal reaction to the crisis, and then the lack of withdrawal in the aftermath. So the question that we basically put forward in the paper is, what are the consequences of this? Uh, 
You know, what are the legacies? So in the paper, we discuss two main legacies. The first one is uh, the lessened fiscal space. And you can go many different ways about how to measure fiscal space. One of them is the so-called primary balance gap. So what is it? The primary balance gap is comparing the actual primary balance with the primary balance that will be required to stabilize debt. And what you see in this picture is that you have a huge reversal from 2008. By 2015, you have all countries with a negative primary balance gap. And what this means is that given the projections that we have for interest rates and growth, if these countries were to maintain current primary balance levels, debt will continue to increase going forward. Okay? So the flip side of this is that there is an increased uh, vulnerability to potential shocks. So what you have is a diminished fiscal space to be able to cope or confront a less favorable, less benign macroeconomic environment going forward. And what you have in this picture first is uh, what are the projections for debt increases up to 2020, and there are real baseline. These are the baseline projections of the IMF. And what you see there is that there is a wide range. In some countries, we are projecting that debt is going to decline in some it's going to increase. And this really depends on whether the countries are already undertaking some fiscal adjustment. Then we consider two types of macroeconomic shocks. The first one, which is very relevant given current conditions, is what if we have a commodity price shock? And what we do there is to assume that commodity prices are going to remain at very subdued levels. If that were to happen, what you see is that there will be a sizable increase in debt relative to the baseline. And the reason why you have this sizable increase is that in some of these countries, there is a high reliance on commodity-related revenue, so the impact is large. You have another macro scenario, which is what if growth was going to be relatively slow? And this productive growth uh, scenario, we model uh, by assuming that real GDP growth is permanently half percentage point lower than under the baseline. And for you to have an idea of why is it that we're assuming this uh, half percentage point, this is more or less the declining potential that you saw in these countries at the peak of the crisis. Okay? And what you see again is that there is again an increase in the debt relative to your baseline. But again, when you compare the commodity price shock with the growth slowdown scenario, you see that for many of these countries, except for two, the main uh, shock is going to be if commodity prices are to remain at these very subdued levels. Now, <coughs> we consider then a third scenario, which is the the, the so-called policy scenario, the what if these countries were going to maintain the uh, spending growth rates that we have seen in the last three years. And this is really where you find very staggering results because for some countries you see increases in debt of up to 20 percentage points of GDP above what you have currently under the baseline. And this is really simply telling you that those trends are not sustainable. They cannot keep on growing and spending at those rates. So what all of this is telling us is that if these countries are to uh, strengthen their resilience, they're going to have to adjust. Okay? And the question that we then uh, uh, address in the paper is how much is the flexibility to adjust? So this is a function of several things, and you will see in these pictures that the flexibility to adjust varies depending on the countries. So the first indicator that we look at is the tax burden. Here we are measuring really the general government revenues. And uh, the uh, prior is that the highest is your tax burden, the less flexibility you have because it's going to be more difficult to actually further increase taxes. So what you have, just to give you a sense, is that uh, a country like Brazil has actually increased the revenues since 2007. Okay? But it's not only they have increased, it's above the 45 degree line. It's relatively high if you compare it not only with the Latin American peers, but with other emerging market peers. So this tells you that the flexibility to adjust through taxes is going to be more limited. At the other end, you have countries like Mexico and Peru. These countries, again, have increased their revenues relative to the pre-crisis levels. But the difference is that their levels are relatively low. So there the scope to adjust through revenues is going to be much wider. Okay? Now, another another kind of like a 
uh, indicator that gives us a sense of how much uh, flexibility it's out there, it's what we call the budget earmarks. So what are the budget earmarks? <coughs> so budget earmarks, what they do is that they set aside a fixed percentage of your uh, funding, of your government revenues, for a specific sectors. So in a way, you have like certain sectors that you may want to prioritize because they are important. And then what you say is that in every budget, a specific percentage of your revenues are going to go to those uh, uh, spending. The main problem with this is that it imposes a lot of rigidity on how you can achieve the adjustment. Because in practice, what's going to happen is that all the adjustment is going to have to fall on those spending items that are not projected. So if you have new priorities, if you find some spending kind of like efficiency gains, still you're not going to be able to reallocate because you have a legal requirement that tells you you need to spend certain amount of your revenues on those spending items. So again, what you see here is that there is quite a bit of variance across these countries. In some countries like Brazil, you have quite a bit of rigidity because budget earmarks are quite large. In other countries, actually, you have much more flexibility because they are very small. Chile, Peru, Uruguay, okay? The third item that we look at, it's uh, the so-called sticky spending. So uh, this is uh, uh, the type of spending that is going to be relatively difficult to reverse from a political perspective. So what we are showing in this chart is the share of public wages and social benefits as a percentage of total spending. These items are going to be very difficult to cut in practice. And what you see is that when you compare the six Latin American countries with other emerging markets, on average, they are not really kind of like misaligned. They are more or less roughly the same. But you see in some cases like Uruguay, it's uh, significantly higher. So depending on these shares and uh, depending on the tax burden, depending on the budget earmarks, what you see is that for some of these countries, the adjustment is going to be relatively difficult to achieve. However, do we have reason to despair? No. <laughs> because uh, one of the things that we find in the paper is that there is significant uh, scope to increase the efficiency of spending. So what we look at, uh, and I cannot go uh, over the technical details, but what we do is try to kind of like measure inputs and outputs. So we look at how much are the revenues that are spent in four major categories of spending, health, education, investment and social benefits, and what are the outputs? And then the outputs or the outcomes are things like the PISA scores in education, they have adjusted life expectancy. So we are trying to measure how effective is this spending in achieving the intended outcomes. And what you see is that when you do that kind of exercise, the potential to improve the efficiency is very large. It ranges from 1% in Chile to three and a quarter percent of GDP in Brazil. And one thing that probably you have noticed in that picture is that a major category where you can have quite significant uh, scope for improving efficiency is health. And this is important because quite a bit of the pressure that these countries are going to face in the future is going to come in that area because of aging and because there will be higher demand <coughs> for services in that area. So what you see there is that there is a significant scope to uh, still provide the services that people are going to demand without necessarily having to increase significantly spending, okay? So this is the first, let's say, legacy that we see uh, from the crisis, the diminished fiscal space, the increased fiscal risk, the need for adjustment. So what is the second one? This is the impact on institutions. And uh, here I will have to refer you to the paper because uh, we have like a very detailed description of what actually happened year by year in each of these countries in terms of the institutional changes. But I want to give you just a snapshot of what exactly happened in 2009. And in 2009, as the extraordinary nature of the crisis was unfolded, what uh, uh, we figured out is that if we wanted to accommodate the fiscal policy response, we needed to bend the rules. And this is by no means exclusive to Latin America, not even to emerging markets. So what happened in many of these countries is that either the framework was not flexible enough, or the urgency was such that they needed to change basically the framework, relax the rules of the game. And you see in this uh, chart basically the types of like, let's say, relaxation that was introduced during this 2009. 
What you have in Brazil, but it's across the board, it's a revision of the deficit targets. That was very common. So originally, we're having certain deficit targets, 3 4.5% of the primary, whatever level, and they reduce it. This was in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. But this was not the only thing. They were also doing accounting adjustments. So they were excluding things from the measure of the deficit target, for example, in order to accommodate. So investment was excluded, other things were excluded. Now, all of these countries did relax the framework in 2009, except for one case, which is Peru. And what you see in Peru there is a black bar, I think, which is they use the straight slopes. So what does it mean? So the framework itself allowed for a relaxation in the face of like major shocks. But the case of Peru, it is very telling because they were able to respond to the crisis, remain within the framework by invoking the straight close because they started with a very strong fiscal position. They were overperforming big time relative to the deficit targets that were implied in the fiscal framework. So even when they relaxed, they used the escape clause, uh, still they were able to remain within the framework. And this again highlights the point that Oya has mentioned before. There is an insurance value in terms of like having big buffers. Now, the main problem that we see is that this was supposed to be temporary. It was an exceptional circumstance. Therefore, we needed to bend the rules. We needed to act quickly. We wanted to support the economy. The problem was is that the relaxation became de facto permanent. So in this picture, what you have is uh, for each of these categories of relaxation, the percentage of countries, we did not sample, the LA6, that actually used that type of relaxation at some point in time after 2009. And what you see is that there were reduction of targets in all countries after 2009 at some point or another. There were one-off an adjustments and accounting adjustments at some point or another. Then you have in some cases, even when they change the targets, they miss the targets. There were cases in which there were changes in coverage. So the uh, a scope that the rule applied to was reduced. There were exclusion things reduced. And even there were some adjustments. So this obviously um, uh, undermined the uh, fact that part of the withdrawal that did not happen was accommodated because the framework was relaxed. We never came back really to the framework as it was prior to the crisis. Now, the good news is that um, improvement is underway in some of these countries. So some of these countries have actually introduced reforms since then, trying to tackle some of like the shortcomings that the framework were kind of like uh, uh, illustrating during the crisis and trying to uh, strengthen the framework itself. So what are the takeaways that we get out of uh, this study? So we say that we have like a three lessons, three big lessons uh, that we kind of like uh, discuss in the paper. The first lesson is that contracyclical fiscal policy cannot be a one-way ticket. So it has to apply symmetrically in downturns and in recovery. So if you are easing during some uh, downturns, this means that you need to withdraw when the economy is recovering. And what we have seen is that this did not happen in the case of the LA6. Okay. So what is the implication of this? So the implication of this is that right now there is a need to reduce buffers. And some of this adjustment is already underway. Now, the size, the timing, and the pace of adjustment varies across countries. It depends on the Fed dynamics. It depends on the macroeconomic and market conditions and several factors. But it's clear that all of them, to a larger or a lesser extent, they will have to apply. This is the first message. Second message is that it is dangerous to make discretionary changes to the fiscal framework without a million turn outcome or an exit plan. Okay? We have mentioned that some of the, uh, let's say, improvements are underway, but we feel that there are three areas that are very important that these countries need to take into account. The first one is that if you want to avoid procyclicality, you need to take account of the cycle, both commodity cycles, commodity price cycles, and output cycles. And also it's important to have some mechanism to constrain uh, uh, spending. And there we have a discussion in the paper that there are some inherent difficulties in using uh, structural measures. 
And therefore, from an operational perspective, sometimes it's easier to have extended coverage systems, okay? The second feature that we think is important is that uh, we need to ensure the stability and integrity of the framework. And for that, several things are required. You need to have the escape clauses that basically give you the flexibility when you need it. But these escape clauses are also are going to define your basically round trip ticket, how are you coming back once you are out. The other thing is that you need an independent fiscal council that is going to assess compliance with the fiscal rule and is going to uh, also look at the budgetary forecast. Are you being too optimistic in your assessment of what the fiscal position is? Now, uh, the, the, the other thing that we think is important is that rules are not there to be changed every other day. So of course, over time, things may kind of like uh, the, the fiscal landscape and the situation may require some changes, but uh, uh, you cannot introduce a rule in which the coverage is redefined every other day. It, you need certain stability there. Now, the third thing that we think is important is you need to have a medium term orientation in your budget. Uh, Decisions that you make today about extending have implications for the future, not only for the current year. And this is where we discuss also in the paper about medium term expenditure <coughs> framework and the importance in setting an anchor when you make policy decisions. <coughs> That's the second thing. The third thing is about the spending. So, so Oya has mentioned that these uh, spending pressures, uh, they are really like a lots of social needs and we saw actually in the paper that uh, quite a bit of increase in spending happen in social areas. So there is a general need to address those needs. But at the same time, these spending pressures are going to continue in the future. And the only way that you will be able to contain those is by increasing the efficiency of the spending. And we saw that the scope there is very large. So with this, I want to finish here. I just want to mention that the paper will come out uh, next week. You can find it in our uh, website, imf.org. And uh, now I guess I pass uh, the baton to James Hava. Sure. Uh, sure, let's take Jim first, and then we'll come back to Carlos. Clean up. Can you hear me now? Perfect. OK. So I guess I wanted to, to thank Oya and Maria Luz for the paper and, and, and to their colleagues also. It's really wonderful. It's uh, very timely and uh, brings up a lot of really interesting issues. I expect that Carlos will cover most of the economic issues, and so I wanted to, to back up and talk about some politics that surrounds it, since that's my specialty. So when we think about these, the impacts on uh, countries in Latin America, and specifically these six countries uh, of the crisis and the, the events surrounding it, I think it's good to think about it in four categories, and, and most of the spotlight is really on two here, but the others are in the background. Uh, the first is the commodities, the commodity prices, and, and Marilus was just mentioning separating the commodity cycle from the output cycle, and I think that's really important because it affects the different countries differently. Some are commodity exporters. Uruguay, for example, is a major commodity importer, especially with hydrocarbons, it makes a difference there. Um, and the commodity cycle, as we have found, especially with hydrocarbons, was not perfectly synchronized with the rest of the cycle. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting and it is a confounding factor, but it's, it's not, I think it's one that's taken into account by the models and so it's, it, um, but it's worth pointing out the differences across countries. The second area would be credit and really credit, uh, in most other financial crises that we've seen and most other cycles that we've seen in Latin America, credit has been itself pro-cyclical. The availability of credit has been strongly pro-cyclical. And that has aggravated the crisis. So it wasn't just on the, the side of the countries, but as well as the, the availability and price of credit in the credit markets. Here, apart from 2008, it really quickly rebounded. And when you had so many, so many uh, developed countries involved and the EU involved in um, extraordinary monetary stimulus, you had really permissive conditions for borrowing. So I think that did affect the response of various countries. So they saw historically low uh, uh, rates and great availability of credit. 
So uh, they took advantage of it, I think. Um, the third place is, is tax, and we don't talk much about tax because really the jury is mostly still out on what can the tax side do about uh, countercyclicality. You would expect that you would like to have a tax system where the income elasticity of tax revenue was very high, and um, it, I think most people intuitively would say that that corporate income taxes are, are maybe a good place there where you expect they would have a high income elasticity of revenue, um, so that your revenues would go down, in effect, during, um, during crises and uh, provide at least some relief to some people. Um, what's interesting is that there are many countries that have l really loaded up on tax exemptions. Well, that really reduces the income elasticity of the tax system because, in fact, the real the purpose of the tax exemption is to get output in those areas of the economy that are not being taxed, which uh, doesn't help in these situations. Well, finally, spending, where we're mostly spending our attention here. Um, you know, the, the clear thing that, uh, I mean, the clear takeaways here, apart from the spending side, the commodities and you know, investment funds, by all means, for all countries that are commodity exporters. Um, but on spending, what I've noticed is that, is that if you were to take a typical history of Latin American investment spending and, and, and public spending cycles, the word most associated with it would not be a uh, response to uh, the world shocks. It would be a response to the political uh, calendar. That is, we have a political business cycle. And so you would have expected in these countries to see big increases in public spending and public investment projects during uh, presidential election years or general election years or just before them. And so you might ask yourself, well, in what countries were they lucky in that their, uh, in the, the indicated policy response to the cyclical problem was also corresponding to their electoral convenience of the ruling party. So if you think about it, we had uh, general elections in Brazil in 2010. We had general elections in Chile in 2009, in Colombia in 2010 also. Um, in Mexico, 2006, with a midterm election in 2009 and then in 2012. Peru, 2006 and, and 2011. And Uruguay, 2009. So there were some countries. Uruguay, oddly enough, the one that didn't really do a strong countercyclical impulse in 2008-2009, would have been favored by the political business cycle to do it in 2009 and didn't. Um, Brazil um, did a significant impulse in 2009, which you could imagine the people in the Workers' Party would have said, this, was, this is going to do us well for uh, the election in 2010. And in Chile, you could imagine also that people in 2009 would have said that that uh, would have been good for the then ruling party. Um, and uh, Colombia also. Um, but uh, Mexico gets off the hook here, and, as, as does Uruguay and improve to a significant, significant extent. In other words, you don't see what you might have expected if you were thinking about Latin American investment cycles, um, say, 15 years ago. You don't see a strong adherence to a political business cycle. And, um, and in some cases, in Uruguay, you have sort of the opposite. You, in, in the year when you would have expected them to be, the Frente Ampere to be pushing uh, lots of investment projects to favor the next uh, election, um, they were not. And, um, and then later on, they put the foot on the accelerator. So that's something that sort of the dog that didn't bark here. I think um, although you do see an awful lot of inertia now on the spending side, and it's something that will have to be dealt with, uh, at least we can say we're not seeing uh, a typical policy um, that was uh, sort of a nightmare from the past. So what else do we have then? Well, clearly the recommendation would be to have uh, an inventory of, of good efficient public investment targets, and uh, to you know, work that inventory in a normal way during normal times, and then to go engage in an awful lot of the projects when you have a moment of extraordinary uh, need for stimulus. The problem is that's not just what's been doing. An awful lot of the uh, spending is on current spending and on personnel and, and on projects that, as you have pointed out, can be made more efficient. So. But I don't think we're up to the level, I mean, if public investment is, is some 15 to 20 percent of the budget, um, you're still in a position where you can affect an awful lot of things through 
uh, speeding it up or slowing it down. So anyway, I'll leave the rest of that to, to Carlos and maybe come back to it uh, in a few minutes. But thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Jim. Carlos? Yeah. If you can uh, bring the microphone a little bit closer, too, so that uh, – and right. maybe even hold it if, if you're going to speak from the lectern. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Because I have a presentation. Sure. Uh, okay. Um, Vero. Um, or Christine, a ver. <laughs> on the, um, do you know how to get it from the computer here? Did you load it? Do you know if it was loaded? Yeah, yeah. Vero, Vero. Yeah? Exactly. Thank you. Right, right, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we found it. Okay. Here's Bill. Okay. Uh, <coughs> thank you so much for uh, uh, thank you to uh, Cynthia, uh, of course, and also to uh, to. Uh, Vero and uh, to the uh, uh, Wilson uh, Center, of course, for uh, having me. Uh, it, uh, uh, it is a true uh, pleasure to be uh, here. Uh, so uh, let me, uh, I uh, truly enjoyed uh, reading the uh, report, I think uh, uh, the uh, report uh, does a very uh, uh, nice job of uh, talking about uh, some of the main uh, fiscal uh, policy issues uh, faced uh, by uh, Latin America and uh, in uh, general, uh, particularly for the uh, 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 for the countries that they uh, focus on, uh, which are these uh, uh, Latin uh, six, but also I think that they uh, bring back uh, once again. I mean, this is a topic that uh, we have been uh, discussing the, uh, for about time. Uh, I uh, would say around uh, 15 years, and uh, it is nice to see that now, uh, particularly in the work at the fund, not in every department, but, but I want to uh, commend uh, Western Ham and OIA and also the uh, fiscal, uh, uh, fiscal affairs department that they have been focusing more and more on the issue of uh, pro-cyclical uh, pro uh, fiscal policy, that is an issue that the fund did not pay too uh, much attention uh, some, uh, I mean, in the past. So uh, let me, uh, because I was told also that this is a general audience that may not be uh, necessarily familiar with some of the big issues. So since uh, Oya and Maria Luz did obviously a very good job uh, talking specifically about the Latin American six, I'd like to put this more in uh, what I call the big picture, right? So uh, why are these uh, important topics uh, and uh, where is it that we are coming from? Right, because we must be coming from uh, somewhere. These are not issues that 
have uh, shown that uh, overnight. So the first point to realize, and I uh, will show you some uh, figures in a second, is that uh, historically, and when I say uh, historically, things uh, going back to 1960, so that is for 55 uh, years, uh, the developing countries have typically pursue what we call a procyclical fiscal policy, right? So a procyclical fiscal policy means that your fiscal policy is going to be expansionary in a, in a good times and is going to be contractionary in a bad times. So that is what developing countries have typically done, okay? And that is obviously, uh, if I can go to the second, okay, uh, um, there should be. Little tech uh, support here. <laughs> perhaps, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, something I was doing on the second line. Uh, uh, cafe press, something that I should do. <laughs> it's not there. After I get the page, where I, how do I get to the yeah, next line? Yeah. Just to be on the safe side, because I'm very afraid of uh, using this guy. <laughs> so uh, having a prosecutor fiscal policy is uh, simply bad public policy. Uh, why? Uh, why uh, is it bad public policy? Because uh, what? Uh, uh, because uh, 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 because uh, what you do is simply to amplify the business uh, uh, cycle, right? Because if you have an uh, expansionary uh, fiscal policy in uh, good times, your boom becomes even bigger. Then in bad times, uh, you have a contractionary uh, fiscal policy, and therefore, you make the uh, recession uh, 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 worse. Right, so this is what uh, many, many years ago when we started uh, working on this issue with uh, Carmen Reijan uh, and uh, Graciela Kaminsky, uh, we call this the, uh, 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 the uh, 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 when it rains, it pours, a phenomenon to convey this idea that you are amplifying the business cycle. And in industrial countries don't do that. I mean, by uh, and large, almost every industrial country, until three, four years ago, let me not talk about the Greece, Italy, and Spain of this world in the last three, four years. Okay, so less, less uh, abstract uh, eh, 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 from that. So I'm going to press the arrow. Okay, yeah. so in this context, uh, let me give you the perennial bad news and good news. Okay, so the good news, given this very bad public policy that uh, the developing countries had been following for about 40 years, I'm going to uh, show you some figures. The, uh, the uh, good news is that many developing countries, uh, many developing countries, uh, to be specific about a uh, about a third 
of uh, developing countries. If you compare pre-2000 to, uh, to post-2000, have been able to uh, graduate. By uh, graduate, uh, we mean that, that a country has been able to switch from pursuing procyclical fiscal policy to pursuing counter-cyclical uh, fiscal policy, right? So clearly, there are a lot of developing countries that have been able to improve the conduct of uh, fiscal policy. But of course, good news always comes accompanied from bad news, and uh, not always, but uh, most of the time. And uh, bad news is that if you look at the level, because the third point is kind of the slope, right? Uh, uh, the bad news is that if you uh, if you look at the level, there is still more than 50% of developing countries, and these are mostly uh, uh, emerging markets that are still uh, procyclical. So let me put some very uh, simple figures. Okay, so this is the percentage of developing countries with procyclical fiscal policy measured on the spending side, which I think is the uh, uh, safest way of doing it for uh, uh, for some uh, uh, technical reasons that I don't uh, want to uh, uh, to uh, uh, get into it. But so uh, you see that in the, the that in the 40 years from 1960 to 1999, more than 80 percent of the developing countries were pursuing procyclical fiscal policy. Okay, so during 40 years, most developing countries were amplifying the spending cycle. Why? Because they were not smart people? No. I mean, we have good explanation as to why we uh, people from <coughs> the developing countries didn't have any choice but to do that. The two main explanation is that you don't have access to credit in bad times, so, so you are forced to uh, have a contraction of fiscal policy in bad time. And then uh, what happens in good times is that there are uh, tremendous uh, pressures to spend. Because once you have uh, a lot of money, people are, uh, uh, people are uh, going to come to you to ask for money. So those are the two main explanations. But look at the big change. So from from the first 40 years to the uh, to the to the last uh, 15 years, uh, this is uh, what I was talking. This uh, graduation rate of about uh, 35 percent, uh, right? So you go from more than 80 percent to around uh, 57. And really, there is not much change between 2000 and 2009 and 2010 and 2014. So, I mean, I understand if you are working with countries, you have to follow the countries very uh, specifically and, uh, and the report does a great job in that. But we in academia, we can afford the luxury to uh, look at things uh, from a little bit more afar. I mean, really, the, the big story is the jump from the plus 80 to the uh, 60 uh, range, right? But then a very important question, and the report does touch on that, is you know that it is a pity that countries did not take advantage of the good times to become a country cyclical. Because as, uh, 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 because as I am uh, going to argue, it is really this during uh, good times that you should try to do this switch, that you uh, should try to uh, graduate. Uh, OK, so let me show you Latin America is a very similar picture. We, uh, this is a uh, work that we have done with uh, uh, with uh, Guillermo Boletin simply to give credit where credit is due. 
uh, you can see that of the 11 countries for Latin America. This is not Latin American and the Caribbean. It is only Latin America. Uh, in the period of these 40 years, 11 out of 11 countries were pro-cyclical, which is quite uh, amazing, right? Now, now, but uh, like in developing countries, so in that sense, uh, Latin America, from when you look at the big picture, is not very different from the whole uh, emerging market uh, universe. Uh, you see like a 40% uh, graduation rate. It goes to 62, 63, and that is uh, constant. Okay, so same picture as for the uh, developing countries. Uh, and now I thought that because the report uh, touches on this uh, Latin American uh, six, I, I will compare. But here I'm just comparing these two periods in which I think not much was happening uh, if you look at the aggregate, right? Because in the first two pictures you saw. But of course, if you look at uh, particular countries, uh, some countries backslid, meaning, you know, uh, became uh, less uh, counter cyclical, uh, uh, and in some sense the report is uh, about this, right? Uh, and uh, we can see, but I look more uh, this, you know, because I take some distance. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I look more uh, this uh, from a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, for instance, my home country, Uruguay, has always been pro -cyclical. I have talked about this uh, uh, with the authorities in Uruguay. I mean, Uruguay, you can do any cut th that you want. Uruguay has always been pro uh, Brazil is a country that had behaved as the report says, uh, pretty well in the 2000, but then, sorry, here I should have said that uh, these are the correlation between the cyclical component of GDP and uh, uh, government spending, and therefore, if you have a positive correlation, it, it means that you are uh, pro-cyclical, okay? Uh, so, uh, Brazil has become very uh, pro-cyclical in the last uh, four years. These are very small samples, right? So we should take this particular graph, not the first two graphs, <coughs> uh, but this particular graph, we should really uh, take it uh, with a grain of salt because the periods are very short, in particular the last period. But the idea that, that you know, I mean, Oh yeah, uh, Maria Luz cannot say that because they are from the fund. Um, I'm in John Hopkins, so it can be a little bit more crude, but <laughs> you have the serious country and the non serious country. They chose not to put Argentina and um, <laughs> Venezuela. I thought about putting them. I felt that I didn't have enough time. But, you know, the non serious country are very pro cyclical, uh, Venezuela. Uh, Argentina, Uruguay, it is a serious country in many, in, uh, uh, many aspects, but not in uh, this aspect. Uh, 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 and then uh, you have the serious country of this world, and the <laughs> best example is Chile. I mean, Chile has been consistently uh, counter cyclical, uh, Brazil comes and goes, and now. Uh, 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 and now countries like Colombia and Peru uh, seem to have gone to the, to the camp of uh, being uh, counter cyclical okay? But uh, we really need more data here to make a more uh, definite uh, uh, assessment. Okay, so this is, uh, so now let me, uh, talk about policies, and this is a public policy forum. And let me be a little bit provocative, but really this is also what I think uh, based on thinking about this issue for many years and also based on uh, research. So 
the report kind of conclude uh, that to some extent many countries should adjust now, right? They should cut their, their uh, fiscal deficit, the argument being that, that they did not build enough what they call uh, fiscal buffers uh, during this last two years. Okay, you know, which is a, uh, which is a very, uh, you know, I mean, uh, which is a very legitimate uh, position to take. But let me talk more broadly about this critical policy issue, because this also applies to uh, Europe. I am not going to talk to Europe, but if we had a whole morning to talk about fiscal policy, I would. I would talk about Greece, I would talk about Italy, I would talk about Spain, okay? I mean, countries that have adjusted fiscal policy in bad times. And as you know, that has been, ex that ha that has been extremely controversial even uh, within the IMF itself. I mean, if not, uh, talk to Olivier Blanchard, right? So the policy question is, should one adjust in bad times? Okay, so let me give you the five points that I think one should think when one thinks about this question. In principle, if you are going to adjust in bad times, I, uh, I am assuming that, that we are starting the bad times, which is true, right? I mean, capital is uh, starting to flow out of emerging markets, Brazil is already in a recession, Argentina is in a recession, Venezuela, of course, is in a recession, uh, Uruguay is, is about to enter into a recession, I mean, Chile has been slowing down, okay? So this to me is the precise moment in which we go from the boost, from the boom to the bust. Uh, so, so if you are going to adjust in bad times, you should only adjust by the structural deficit. And I don't want to get uh, technical here. This is a topic that I talk to the authors afterward. But, but you have to adjust only for what think of the structural deficit as the permanent deficit. I mean, the deficit that does not depend on the cycle. That is the only one that you should cut not the uh, cyclical, because by definition, the cyclical deficit, when the good times come, is gonna become a cyclical surplus. That is what cycle means, okay? So, and it is very complicated, I mean, just from a technical point of view, to be able to compute that permanent fiscal deficit that you should, uh, that you, uh, but suppose, suppose that you have that, I mean, suppose that you're able to say, okay, so a country like Uruguay like, uh, has a permanent fiscal deficit of 1.35, so let's cut the 1.35, right? Uh, I don't think it is a good idea to advise the country to cut the fiscal deficit because in some sense, uh, uh, what you're doing is to reinforce the precise behavior that you are trying to uh, to uh, eradicate. We all agree, I mean, practicality of fiscal policy in uh, emerging markets is perhaps the biggest scourge in, micro in macroeconomic fiscal policy over the last 50 years. So we are all trying to eradicate that behavior. So to sort of advise to be procyclical, because to cut a fiscal deficit in bad times is to be procyclical, I mean, sounds a little strange. It is like uh, telling to something to somebody that, that is trying to quit uh, drinking to tell him or her, you know, you are doing a pretty good job, so let's uh, celebrate by uh, having a drink, you know. <laughs> it, 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 there is something that does not quite uh, um, quite uh, make sense there. Uh, and also, of course, if you cut during bad times, uh, what you're 
going to do is to make the recession worse. This, uh, when it rains, is called phenomenon. I mean, there is evidence. Uh, we have done some work on uh, multiplier where we show that that the multiplier uh, depends on whether, <coughs> not only on whether you are in a boom or in a recession, but also on whether government spending is going up and down. And you have a very big multiplier in a recession when G is uh, going down. So you would be uh, provoking or aggravating a, a recession that may be already underway that in turn is going to lower tax revenue. I mean, the elasticity of tax revenues in developing countries is huge. Is one five two, so uh, so uh, so the uh, fiscal deficit is going to increase a lot when your intention is uh, presumably to uh, improve the uh, fiscal deficit. So even from a very uh, practical uh, point of view, that may not be a bad idea. So just to leave you with a thought, uh, uh, bad times are probably a bad time to adjust, okay. But we can argue uh, about that. So uh, last, uh, last uh, uh, slide and I'll be done. So to me, the best time to change behavior is in the uh, good times. I mean, that is why, that is when you really need to convince the authorities or to better put, the authorities need to convince yourself. I don't think that the IMF or, and it's not because of the IMF, I don't think that any outside forces, particularly in Latin, in Latin American countries that are very much uh, their own uh, people, I mean, it is the authorities that need to be convinced that to abandon uh, procyclicality is the best uh, thing uh, to do. But uh, I'm very uh, convinced that the best time to change behavior is in good times when everything is going well. I mean, try to find incentive and uh, mechanism. And the uh, uh, report does a very nice job in talking about fiscal rule, in talking about other institutional uh, mechanisms that may uh, give rules or may give incentive to save in good times. Because this is economic one-on-one. I mean, in the first lesson to my students in the master at size, I show a little model and the prescription of the model is you save in sunny day for the a, a rainy day, right? So that is behavior 101. It is also fiscal policy a, a 101. Of course, it is much uh, easier said than done, but uh, we can come up with rules, and as I said, I mean, I mean the report does a, a very nice uh, job at uh, they even have a, a full table on the rules that are in effect. And just to, I mean, I find that the commodity stabilization funds are a very important component. I mean, think of the copper uh, stabilization fund in Chile has been extremely important because they have a rule that more or less they have followed in which they save when the price of copper is high and they de-save uh, uh, when the uh, price of copper is low. So uh, that is a uh, counter-cyclical uh, uh, policy and of course fiscal rule, fiscal rule based on uh, structural. It is very hard to compute the structure of fiscal deficit. We are going to have a more technical conversation with the author, but I always say to whomever wants to listen to me, it is much better to have a rule based on a, on a imperfect structural fiscal deficit than to have a rule based on an actual fiscal balance 
on a natural fiscal uh, balance which makes absolutely no sense. So for instance, the uh, Maastricht rule made no sense, okay? Uh, uh, then, but this applies only to the <laughs> program countries. So the LA6, of course, have, have not had a program in, I don't know, uh, many, many years. But uh, an, an idea that I have mentioned before, but unfortunately, it obviously doesn't apply to the LXEs, but to poor countries, perhaps in Africa or other places, because as I say, the procyclicality is a, a worldwide phenomenon, is to try to tie the help, the loans that the IMF may grant at bad times to good behavior in uh, good times. Like saying, if you save in good times, if you save from a fiscal point of view in uh, good times, then we may help you in bad times. And I am not an expert in fund, uh, in fund uh, programs, but I think that the fund uh, has tried to, uh, has tried to, uh, has tried to implement uh, uh, such a rule. And just to conclude, you know, I have the luxury because I don't have to deal uh, with the country themselves to, to talk and to put issues on the board, but this is a very difficult macroeconomic fiscal problem to deal. I mean, it is an issue that has been with us for uh, 50, uh, for, uh, 50 uh, years. I think that we are doing better. I mean, to be the big news is this uh, graduation of 35%. Uh, to me, that is the big uh, picture. We we need to bring down that uh, figure, but it is a very difficult uh, issue to deal. I think it is the most important macroeconomic fiscal challenge, macro fiscal challenge that emerging uh, markets uh, 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 face, but it is very difficult to deal because particularly because of the political pressure to spend in good times. No, because when the time, because when the bad times come, it is too late. Okay, I mean, I mean, if you are uh, going through a crisis and you don't have external financing, you have no choice to contract fiscal policy. So it is not that you are choosing. You have no choice but to be prosecuted. So when the bad times come, it is too late. The thing is to try to do something in good, in, in, in good times, to try to save part of this huge uh, windfall from commodity booms and so forth, and that is hard to do. And it is not so much economic, it is for in political economy, because uh, because the uh, uh, pressure to spend in uh, good times and occasionally on very uh, on very uh, uh, worthy causes is very very hard. Thank you. Great. Okay, we have a number of excellent presentations. A lot of issues on the table. Um, one of the things, I know we have a lot of uh, interest in participating, but one question I'd like to sort of put on the table um, that, that Jim really hinted at uh, was how to reintroduce politics um, into this. And Carlos, I think you, by bringing up the cases of Italy and Greece and Spain, you know, uh, suggested that very heavily. Think of a country like Colombia um, that ha earns a huge amount of its um, export revenue from oil exports facing um, a, a decline in prices. Also has a very responsible regla fiscal, a fiscal rule that requires it to reduce the deficit sort of progressively and is potentially going to sign a peace agreement with the guerrillas and therefore will have to increase public spending um, in, in a lot of different categories. Um, there are political pressures, quite apart from the, the unique circumstances of, of Colombia vis-a-vis -vis the peace process, you have uh, people who have left poverty over the last decade, 
um, an expanded middle class. Um, everyone has talked about, you know, that is the big sort of story um, um, and success story um, of the first decade of the, of the 21st century people now who are demanding more of their government and certainly demanding better quality and some of that can be um, provided as you have suggested in your report by an increase in, in efficiency of, of state spending. But nonetheless, the pressures to spend are not gonna go away um, and they are gonna be felt even more acutely as economies contract and people's <coughs> incomes um, and ability to, to, to save and, and to earn money go down. So, you know, I'd like to have that sort of as a backdrop, not to ask, not to go back to the panel, but, but have that as a backdrop in, in the real world, sort of how do, how do countries face these very real pressures. Um, after all, we celebrate the fact that these are democracies and that elected leaders are, are responsible and, and should be responsive to electorates. So um, not to be a populist and do this in an irresponsible way, but but nonetheless to address um, social needs. So um, let's open it up. Uh, we have microphones, so I'll start here with Teresa. Uh, please introduce yourself and speak into the mic. We'll take a couple questions and then come back to the panel. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm Teresa Terminacian. I used to be the director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the fund. First of all, congratulations. This is really a nice report. I, I really look forward to reading it in, uh, in, in detail. I have two co small short comments and uh, two uh, kind of questions. The first uh, uh, is um, you know, on uh, the public investment role. Uh, I think that we all agree that public investment is the, the uh, ideal uh, vehicle for counter-cyclical fiscal policies, uh, both on structural and on uh, uh, you know, cyclical uh, um, criteria. However, the fact of the matter is that A, public investment uh, uh, normally takes place with a lag and uh, uh, you know, both uh, uh, in terms of preparing it and then executing and so on, and so may not be really very effective in terms of short-term counter-cyclical. And certainly this was the case why in 2009 it wasn't very much used by some, even some advanced countries. The second is that public investment in Latin America increasingly is, is not being done by the central government. It's being done by subnational governments. And so it may be quite difficult to engineer you know, the, 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 uh, such a uh, change uh, in, a, in a short time. The second point uh, is that um, I agree <laughs> that uh, it's very necessary to emphasize efficiency gains, but you know, uh, from what you were showing, the, the bulk of these efficiency gains are in areas like uh, 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 health and education. And in a country like Brazil, there are earmarks. I mean, <laughs> there are basic constitutional requirements that 25% uh, of uh, spending should go to education and uh, um, that uh, the spending uh, uh, on, uh, on health is also constrained in relation to, 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 GD to grow in, 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 li in line with GDP. So, you know, the scope for reducing these expenditures through efficiency gains is limited. Now I have two, two questions. Uh, one is, would you agree that uh, uh, Latin America really needs to strengthen its automatic stabilizers? And, uh, but that means uh, uh, that you know, th there is a need for considerable change in the structure, of the particularly of the tax system, as well as a better pr uh, system of, uh, of protection uh, uh, through unemployment, unemployment compensation. And finally, uh, Maria Luce, you talked about uh, um, you know, uh, improvements in uh, the current fiscal policy stance. I agree <laughs> that uh, in some countries there is improvement in the, in the stance of fiscal policy, but I don't agree that so much uh, has been done yet in terms of strengthening fiscal institutions. Basically, rules remain pretty much what they were before. Uh, only Chile has some kind of a fiscal council. And, um, you know, my, uh, well, fiscal policy, medium-term fiscal policy frameworks are uh, uh, still uh, uh, sort of in, in some of the countries in, uh, 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 rather underdeveloped. <coughs> sure. Other, other questions? That was pr a pretty meaty one. Uh, let's take uh, the here in the right, right there, and then this gentleman in the back. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, uh, I'm Judith Gold from Western Hemisphere Department. Um, uh, very, very interesting presentation, uh, very in informative. I have uh, two questions, one to Oya and, uh, sorry, and Mar 
Marty Lou. Uh, you, get, you talked about uh, gains in efficiencies <coughs> as providing scope to reduce expenditure. Uh, and I was very curious because for us in trying to advise countries, we, it's very difficult to actually uh, get those gains and especially to get them quickly, maybe over three, four years. Uh, and even then, it's always questionable. So I kind of would like you to talk more about that because this is, was one of your reasons for being optimistic. Uh, <coughs> and a question to Carlos, um, are we now in bad times? And would your advice be, therefore, that these um, countries should not be adjusting? Uh, so I, I was very curious. I mean, this is not going to be a repeat of the 80s if, if they don't adjust and we're going to start building the debt again. So uh, just these two questions. Sure. And then here in the back, and we'll come back to the panel. Um, Sam Morley from IFRI. Uh, this question for Carlos. Um, no, two questions. Uh, one is I don't quite understand your connection between the structural deficit and the need to adjust. Uh, you, you talked about adjusting in, in recession, but the structural deficit by your definition isn't affected by whether the country is in a recession or a recovery. So why does it need to adjust? Obviously, if, it, if you're going to go with the, your rule on the structural deficit, then the actual deficit is going to go up in recession and down in booms. And why do you need to worry about that? Um, the second question is, what's the role or what's the connection between c the capital account or capital inflows and the state of the economy, and how much does that affect the decisions that you have to make on fiscal policy? Okay, who wants to uh, begin? I can sure. say a few words. Um, I don't know if this is on. Starting uh, with Teresa's helpful comments. Um, one issue you highlighted was earmarks. We, it's definitely a strong rigidity that makes the adjust the consolidation fall into a smaller set of items that then hurt more. Uh, it's a it's a serious longer term challenge for the flexibility, um, not necessarily for the immediate um, juncture, but definitely we wanted to highlight that as a something that governments have to review uh, uh, carefully going forward. Subnational governments, investment is a broader issue. We haven't covered it much, but it's true. The one issue that we discussed a, lo a lot among ourselves is the coverage of the rules, how important it is that it uh, extends to not just the central government, but to fun parts of the government that undertake these important investments. And maybe Maria Luz can say more about that. Automatic stabilizers, definitely, the more, the stronger they are, the less there is a need to rely on discretionary changes, which this experience shows us is qu quite hard to reverse. It's the, it relying more on automatic stabilizers would just um, avoid the need to get out of your framework to do uh, a policy response. So uh, that's very helpful. Of course, the trade-off there is between efficiency. Um, the, uh, the some some of these. Uh, changes can come with um, a larger, uh, I mean, a tax, a tax policy that can at some, at some point start having efficiency losses. Again, I think it's, it has to be on a case-by-case case, case basis uh, analyzed for each country, but it, I think it's a very good um, point. I think for now, I mean, I'll just say that and uh, let you chime in. Yeah, I, 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 I'll be happy to hear uh, uh, your point, Cynthia, about Colombia. I think it is very important, uh, and I think that this is lost uh, uh, sometimes in the public discussion of this issue, that when uh, one is talking about pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical uh, fiscal policy, we are always talking about fiscal policy over the cycle. Uh, we are not really taking any position about what a country should decide to do with its uh, social spending if they decide to have a permanent raise in tax uh, revenues. So, so for instance, I'm all for countries in Latin America uh, that obviously uh, have a very low level of uh, social 
safety net and social insurance and so forth to have higher public uh, expenditures on, that, uh, on those areas. And if those higher permanent public expenditures are financed by higher permanent tax revenues, that uh, doesn't affect the, the uh, discussion on uh, cyclicality at all. Uh, so I feel S that... Spoken like a true Uruguayan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that uh, that is uh, 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 an important point. Uh, 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 on the issue, Teresa, of the automatic table access, and just to build on what Hoya said, I mean, I fully agree. I mean, we actually, in some of our uh, work, uh, find a huge difference if you compute the correlation of, uh, of uh, government spending and the uh, GDP cycle for industrial countries, for a, for a very narrow measures of government spending, you find even industrial countries being either acyclical or uh, slightly prosecutor. But as soon as you take broader measures of government spending, the industrial countries become clearly uh, so obviously, to the to the extent it it is uh, it is uh, easier said than done, but to the, the extent that uh, we can uh, uh, to the extent that that uh, we can uh, incorporate uh, automatic stabilizers in emerging countries, because at least in the data, there is a they don't show up. I mean, we have compute correlation between the narrow and the broad, it is the same. And that is a clear mm -hmm. indication that there are so few automatic tribulations that it doesn't matter if you compute correlation with narrow or broad. Uh, on the question uh, by uh, Julia, uh, Julie, sorry, right, in gold. Uh, um, my position uh, would be that in bad times, if you can avoid adjust, I mean, unless you get into a very catastrophic situation, just don't uh, uh, adjust. And I don't see Latin American countries, at least as of now, I mean, perhaps we can come back in two, three years and say, you know, the fiscal situation in Latin America is so dire that, that we need to adjust even in bad times, uh, and uh, we all happen to agree of that. But as of now, I don't see a very uh, urgent need to, uh, uh, to uh, implement a tough or close to tough fiscal adjustment. That's, that's uh, my view. And then on some, yeah, perhaps I wasn't clear enough. Uh, what I meant, I mean, ideally, I mean, if you have a rule like, a Chile, like Chile, the uh, structural deficit should always be equal to zero, and that is the measure of uh, success of the uh, of the uh, rule. What happens uh, sometimes, and I think that that's a point that is making the report, is that you may uh, have a country that instead of having zero has gone to minus 1.5. So that 1.5 uh, should be adjusted so that it, uh, uh, so that it uh, goes back to zero which uh, should be uh, the, uh, 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 which uh, should be the right uh, structural deficit uh, over the uh, cycle. So, so that's a clarification. And then your last point on the capital flow. So, uh, huge issue. I mean, really, with Carmen and, and Graciela in 2000, we started thinking about that, and it was funny. We started thinking on the pro-cyclicality of 
capital flows. And then we sort of end up oh, on the procedicality of uh, fiscal policy. So all I can do that, that the procedicality of capital flows, meaning that capital flows clearly are very abundant in good times and they are partly responsible uh, for the uh, good times in uh, emerging markets and then the opposite uh, uh, and then the opposite is true make all these kind of uh, uh, problems even uh, worse because big capital inflows imply that the expansion in the economy uh, is uh, going to be bigger I mean uh, 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 implies that uh, consumption is going to go up, uh, GDP is uh, going to go up, uh, tax revenues, the elasticity of tax revenues in uh, emerging countries is uh, tremendous. So the, so the coffers of the treasury are literally bursting with money. And it's very difficult to finance ministers, I mean, it's very difficult for finance minister, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Alejandro can, can tell us some stories about this. I mean, it is very hard for uh, finance uh, ministers to say no to people who come to us for more money when they know that your uh, coffers are full of money, to the point that, for instance, Domingo Cavallo, in his early incarnation, when he was doing actually very well, and this was an inspiration for a paper that we wrote uh, with Talvi as an explanation for the prosecutorial fiscal policy, he would publicly say, look, I'm in very good times. I have all this money in my coffers. I would, I would rather reduce tax rate, which if you think about is prosecutorial fiscal policy, you are doing expansion fiscal policy in a good times because I would rather give back that money to the public that because they are going to be able to make better use than me uh, having to give this money to all these lobbying groups that I cannot hold any longer. So, so that is a very important issue. Great. Um, let me just uh, follow up on a couple of issues. So I agree fully with uh, Teresa that the scope to reap the efficiency gains to a certain extent is limited by the assistance of these budgetary regimes and, and by the earmark. So obviously, to the extent that you don't address them, uh, there is no way that you can actually uh, reap those, uh, those efficiency gains. Now, in terms of the question on the automatic stabilizers, I guess that there are two things. One is whether you want to let automatic stabilizers work. And then the other one is whether we want to expand the size of the automatic stabilizers. And I think that these are two different questions. So on the first one, I think that our policy has always been that, yes, you should let automatic stabilizers uh, work. And partly the thinking that uh, as, as long as you have the money to do it, I guess, but uh, the, the thinking in terms of like our policy recommendations in the paper is precisely you want to adjust for the cycle so that what you are looking is not a nominal deficit but a structural adjusted deficit. So that's uh, the, the thinking behind it. Now, in terms of the size of the automatic stabilizers, uh, uh, I think that probably you know very well, the last fiscal monitor is looking a little bit on this issue. And on the fiscal stabilization value, uh, the empirical evidence is that in emerging markets, that value is lower than in advanced economies. At the end of the day, automatic stabilizers is about a policy choice, how big your public sector is. And this is basically a, a policy choice. And uh, exactly, uh, but this is also a policy choice, how much you want to tax, how much you want to, uh, to spend. Now, the, the issue... Exactly, but one of the things actually that we do find though is that the, let's say, the long-term growth impacts of these automatic stabilizers, uh, they are much smaller in emerging markets than they are in, the, in the advanced economies. And if you were to introduce, then you have to be careful because there are distortions that can be introduced. So, so it's not just any type of automatic stabilizers that you should be considering. So I think that I will refer you to the fiscal monitor because 
this is a tricky, it's a tricky subject. It's not just all, and it's the empirical evidence that we, we at least were able to find uh, was not very strong for emerging markets. On the improvements on the um, fiscal institutions, I agree with you. There are some countries that uh, have a long way to go, <laughs> but it's also the case that there are some countries that have made substantial uh, improvements. They have, Peru has introduced a structural balance rule, uh, Mexico introduced an expenditure rule, although there are some exclusions. You have even Colombia. So there have been some changes that are changes in the right direction, also in terms of the definition of escape clauses. Do I think that the work is done? No. And I agree with you that probably there, there is a much bigger scope that on the fiscal stance, I think that is true that in general you have many countries that have already taken action. And then there is the issue of whether can we kind of spending through efficiency gains. This is not really what we are advocating in the paper. What we are really advocating in the paper is that you're going to see spending pressures. And what we saw and the scenario that I presented uh, clearly illustrates is that if you continue under the past uh, trends, this is not sustainable. Now, the only way that you are going to be able to uh, stop that or contain those top of uh, pressures is through the efficiency gains. But this is not going to be your only way out in terms of adjustment. Uh, Jim, Mayan, do you want to add some, some remarks on uh, part of the discussion? Yeah, can you hear all right? Yep, we're good. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up on the automatic stabilizers part. I mean, if you, I mean, imagine in some um, Latin American labor markets where 50% of the, of the uh, economically active population is involved in the informal sector, what uh, an unemployment insurance uh, program would look like. And uh, you can see why a lot of countries are not embracing this as, as a way of, uh, a way of bringing about some kind of automatic stabilization. And uh, I think on the tax side, if you have to, if you actually have to do what Domingo Cavallo wanted to do and do, do a explicit tax cut, well, then it's not automatic. I mean, you <clears throat> you have to make that political decision every single time you're looking at it. And, and just as with public investment projects, there's going to be a delay. It's going to be uncertain. Sometimes you'll do it. Sometimes you won't. It'll depend on the political cycle, I think, as well. So, so yeah, you have to build something in there that doesn't require anybody to make any decisions at all. And uh, the ideal is, uh, is, is unemployment insurance. And uh, that's really not a big phenomenon in a lot of places we're looking at. I think we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. Sure, right up here. Yeah. If you could wait for the microphone for one second, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ken Meyer, Cork World Docs. I got here a little late, so I, I don't know whether the automatic stabilization programs uh, refer to such things as uh, the drop in the price of oil uh, recently. Um, that would seem to be a bonanza for con consumer countries. Uh, have they responded in the uh, way you would hope? Uh, to this bonanza? Uh, I don't know whether you could generalize or just mention some case studies. And last question over here. Hi, I'm Marcos Poblas Hibero from Research Department and the IMF. And I have a question for Professor Jean. So uh, a lot of things that we discussed here involve like, actually political decisions. I mean, we discuss about like uh, spending rigidity, tax reforms, and uh, you know, in some of these countries, for example, Brazil, Tax reforms has taken like uh, years of discussion in the Congress and uh, doesn't hasn't taken place. So my question to you is like, is there something from political economy that you can learn that would make or facilitate these reforms to take place? And for example, like reducing these rigidities. I mean, for example, I've s I know that like uh, in Italy, Italy is uh, undertaking an exercise in reforming the upper house. So. Is there any type of lesson from political economy that could actually facilitate this type of reforms? Thank you. Sure. Why don't we take that in reverse order? Jim, why don't you start with this? Yeah, OK. Um, Brazil has the luxury, I think, of not having to increase uh, its total tax burden. Its tax burden is already uh, quite ample and I think uh, subject to, I think, a lot of valid complaints. So. One of the things that we, you find out with political economy is that if you announce to the public and if the public actually knows that you're going to have to increase your uh, tax burden as a proportion of GDP, then everybody's expectations are anchored on a tax increase. And so that will include everybody, including um, the most wealthy. And very soon you will have a campaign that says we are hurting the middle class. 
And when you lose the middle class, you lose the politics of tax reform. So those tax reforms that involve big jumps in um, overall tax pressure tend to happen only during crises in the beginning of, uh, of, of political administrations when there's still some capital to spend. And there's the hope that by the time the next election rolls around, the pain will have been forgotten. Brazil's case is special, I think, because it has the opportunity. It, it, it is not in this situation. It has to redistribute and make more efficient the tax burden and uh, to somehow harmonize uh, state value-added taxes. And, uh, and I, there are a lot of challenges, though. This is, Brazil's problem is that the, 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 the issue is so multidimensional. And I think Teresa could probably speak more on this than I could. But uh, it is so multidimensional that it's really, really hard to get started. And as one commentator pointed out, um, it's a problem that everybody realizes is there and nobody thinks is ever going to get solved. Maria? Maria Luz? Algo más? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, on the commodities, yes, it was, a, it, it was an aspect of our uh, discussion. We did cover that in the ahead of the crisis during the commodity boom. Many crises built the buffers which enabled them to deploy stimulus. Was it optimal? That's, you know, you know that depends a bit on the model you use. Uh, Carlos showed some. Um, encouraging slides that showed that the fiscal totality in these countries as a ge in general had uh, was reduced between 2000 and 2009 so at least we know that relative to previous periods the, the management of these resources had improved a lot if if i can i i just wanted to respond a bit to carlos's um, comment or questions uh, in general about what should these countries do so if they haven't been sufficiently counter-cyclical or should they should the price of some fossil totality be further fossil totality going down the road? Maria, can you pull the microphone a little closer? Yeah, yeah thanks. Thank you. I think uh, the, our approach to this is quite dependent on the specifics of each country's circumstances. Um, we see, we've discussed this at in depth in our regional surveillance products. It depends on two things, whether the economy is heading towards significant measurable resource underutilization and whether you have fiscal space. So I think those are the two parameters we look at. And that yields a varied approach among these countries. There's, we see a need to build buffers going forward in all of them, but the pace at which we feel they should do that is quite varied, again, depending on um, those two parameters. Um, I think I just leave it at that. We can discuss more. Sure. Have a word? No. Good. Well, Alejandro, Jim, Carlos, Oya, <laughs> Maria Luz, thank you very much for um, enlightening us and, and stimulating this discussion. A pleasure to uh, have you here. Thank you all for joining us. Please join me in thanking our thank panelists. Thank you. thank you to Cindy and the Wilson Center. Great. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Omaira. Thank you, Veronica, everybody who helped make this happen. Thank you oh, so yeah, much. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> you. you're, uh, you're going to throw 